and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. I am excited today. Um, we're going to take a deep dive into the 19th annual IBM Cost of a Data Breach Report. It's one of my favorite annual reports, and this year's report is based on insights from about 604 organizations who've been impacted by a data breach between March of 2023 and February of 2024. So, you know, hot off the presses, this, you know, th these instances just happen. This research is conducted each year by the Ponemon Institute, and it's sponsored, analyzed, and published by IBM. Some of the things in the report include, of course, the average cost of a data breach, um, the most common factors that lead to a breach, the mean time that organizations report that it takes them to identify and contain a breach, costs of a data breach by ge geography and industry, the involvement of law enforcement with ransomware attacks and the impact of that. And last but not least, the report, of course, won't leave out AI, but it takes a look at the use of AI and automation in prevention and detection. So lots of good stuff. I'm joined today by Sam Hector, who's Global Strategy Leader for IBM Security. Sam, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. Hey, Shelley. Thanks ever so much for that great introduction. It's a report I enjoy uh, being involved with every year and every year it turns up something new. So I'm really excited to go through it with you today. Oh, I feel the same way. I really do look forward to seeing it every year and, you know, just kind of diving in there. So we are going to jump right in. We know that instances of data breaches are escalating the world over. And naturally, it's not no surprise that costs associated with a breach and, and regulatory fines associated due to breaches are rising as well. But let's zero in on industries for starters. Um, for anybody paying attention at all, the healthcare industry has long been sort of the juiciest target for cyber threat actors. I noticed in this year's report that the average cost of a data breach calculated was about 4.88 million in the healthcare space. Um, oh, hold on, let me back up here and say, I've got this wrong. Okay, I'm gonna start, see, I goofed up, so I'm going to, I'm going to start this. Yeah, later. no worries, no worries. Okay, so the healthcare industry remains the juiciest target for cyber threat actors. And I noticed that while the average cost of a data breach calculated by this year's report was about 4.88 million in the healthcare space, the average cost of a data breach is 9.77 million. So a significant difference there. And it's healthcare space has the highest industry average for 14 years running. So why is healthcare so vulnerable, Sam? It's a really interesting question. And if you look at the graph of cost of a data breach by industry, healthcare is way out in the lead at the number one spot. You know, yes. the next industry below it is the finance sector at just above 6 million. So there is a huge gap to the leader in healthcare. And I think this is because they are the mo most vulnerable industry to disruption by and large. It's not just data at risk. It's about patients' lives and, and yeah. it's about the most sensitive information that any of us have as humans about our healthcare and our well-being. Um, and attackers have been capitalizing on this vulnerability since the very start of the pandemic. I mean, they, they've been in the lead for, for a very long time. Right. The other factor here is that healthcare breaches on average took the longest to contain at nearly 300 days on average to contain a breach in the healthcare sector. And... You know, this is exacerbated by other things like um, costly regulatory fines that you alluded to, right. um, the likelihood of lawsuits. Um, in particular, you know, people get very litigious when it's their health data um, that's right. at risk or, or has been breached. And there's a much higher per record cost, as in for each human that gets impacted by a data breach yeah. um, for each compromised data subject in healthcare. Well, that, that makes sense. You know, the way that I try to think about this and try to explain it to others is that um, the healthcare industry, and I, you know, I, I, I challenge people to put themselves in your doctor's office or visiting a clinic. And it, today's healthcare settings have so many internet connected devices. And many of those devices weren't actually originally designed to be connected. So that's happened. And then you've got this abundance of 
PII, personally identifiable information. You know, think about all the things healthcare providers know about you, <laughs> your name, your date of birth, your social security number, your address, all of those things. Um, and I think the other thing is that when you think about, you know, if you put yourself in the mind of um, a threat actor, you know, what they are looking for, this is about you know, this is about financial reward, right? And so I think that, you know, when you can breach a healthcare um, organization and you can essentially shut them down and put them in a position where patients may actually die, um, it, it lights a fire under people. So I understand the allure of the healthcare space. Um, what do you see, what do you see healthcare organizations doing to address the security risks that they face. And do you see them making progress? Yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting question. I think you're right to highlight that it's much more complex for healthcare because of the years of technology debt that they've built up. So they right. have complex interconnected systems which often don't talk to each other and they have a high proportion of OT, operational technology, you know, that probably should be talking to IT but be firewalled yeah. off. It's a whole mess, right? It's a mess. Um, so the, I guess the good news is, and one thing that we have seen um, improve this year, is that firms across the board, but also in healthcare, are getting better at actually detecting threats quicker. And this comes back to the, to the AI discussion we were having. But I think um, there's a few reasons that companies are getting quicker at detecting threats. And when you detect them quicker, you can respond to them quicker and the overall right. cost is reduced. Um, I think it comes from new AI techniques and, and automation, but also I think in the security industry recently, we've actually seen a convergence of tools, um, you know, whereas healthcare sector used to have to employ a SIM tool for kind of threat detection, a SOAR tool for response, EDR to monitor their endpoints, which are often on Windows XP if you're in a hospital, you know, you know, all of these tools are actually converging into platforms and making it much more effective um, to not only detect a breach, but also recover from it when it inevitably does occur. Right. So I think that is one positive we can take into account. Um, but also, as you say, you know, these regulations are making healthcare organizations pay attention to the risk factors that are at play much more than they did um, necessarily in, in the past. Well, I think we've just learned so many lessons, whether we're talking healthcare or manufacturing or other critical infrastructure, um, you know, antiquated um, IT systems are very, very dangerous, you know, and so figuring out a way to up level that and, and finding trusted vendor partners to help or managed services providers to help and that sort of thing. I mean, it really is, is it shouldn't be an option to be relying on outdated technical equipment. It just shouldn't be. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned that um, MSSP approach. Yeah. I think, you know, we've actually seen in the data this year something quite interesting, which uh, you know, more firms are outsourcing their yeah. security, um, you know, the, the conduct of, of their security to a trusted partner. And actually, we've seen a, a huge year on year increase um, in the number of organizations that discovered the breach either themselves or through their trusted security partner. Which um, is wonderful. Right. Because if yeah. you're told by the person that is, you know, uh, or the organization or the criminals that are uh, you know, giving you the ransom, you've already lost huge amounts of time that you could have right. been spending on trying to mitigate and recover from the attack. So it was something like 27% um, year on year, we saw firms identifying the breaches themselves. Yes, I saw that as well. I thought that was really very, very good news. So Sam, I noticed the industrial sector also saw a significant increase in costs per instance of breach, rising about 18% from 2023's numbers. This equates to a cost of about 830,000 per breach. What do you attribute that breach to, or that increase to? I think it's, it's similar to the healthcare conversation we just had in that um, you mentioned attackers are doing this for the money. I think what we've seen increasingly this year is that it's not just financially motivated these days. <laughs> sometimes it's chaos. It's, it's exactly, you know, yeah. sometimes it's just how do we cause the maximum disruption? Yes. Um, and in the industrial sector is so inherently connected with critical infrastructure and the way that an economy functions 
that makes them a really prime target for attack. Not only do you get the leverage over that organization of, you know, any kind of downtime in a manufacturing facility or, um, or in a, you know, oil plant, whatever is incredibly costly on a per hour or per day basis, right. you get that leverage, but then you also get the leverage of the government and the regulators breathing down their neck saying, this is having a huge knock on impact right. to the rest of the economy. Um, and so I think they're both a prime target for attack, both from a kind of financial leverage point of view, but also from, as you say, a pure chaos point yeah. of view, unfortunately for them. And they also have that um, OT, IT divide yeah. um, that we spoke about in healthcare and that kind of years of legacy tech debt often is the case in the industrial sector as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think it also bears mentioning that in some instances, attacks are financially motivated. I mean, you know, you can you can go online on the dark web and buy ransomware as a service, um, you know, malware. You can do all different kinds of things. They've made this as easy as <laughs> buying SaaS applications, right? But often, by the way, with great customer support as well. Like great even customer than... support. Yeah. Absolutely. So there there is certainly a contingent of cyber criminals who are financially motivated, the more attacks you can launch, the, you know, the faster you can do it, the more you can identify high value targets. And by the way, I'm even seeing some instances in, in the industry where it's not only just high value targets that people are going after. So that, I think that's one part of the, the threat actor co contingent. But I think we've, we've also got nation state actors, we've got and, and they have a different goal. And I think perhaps that in some instances, they may be interested in chaos, creating chaos. And some of it, I think, uh, is also maybe a power move. Um, you know, look what we can do to you. And, um, you know, when we're talking about North Korea or Russia or China, um, there it's very interesting because they, they are, um, they, are great at playing the long game. They're not in this for a quick financial hit. They want to get in. They want to spread throughout systems. They want to watch and learn and then take, you know, their opportunities when they can. So I think it's really important to to know that there are different, differently motivated cyber threat actors. A hundred percent. And I and I think you see that borne out in the attack vector and the dwell time. You know, yeah. you can tell how complex of a um, of a threat actor you're dealing with. Yeah. Exactly as you say, by, you know, how did they get into the systems and how adept were they at navigating those systems and, and doing a kind of low and slow um, a attack on yeah. an organization? And, you know, for those that are interested in, in more statistics on that, we have another report that comes out called the Threat Intelligence Index every year where we go into a bit more detail around kind of specific tactics and techniques of, of different threat groups that we see acting across the world. Is that already published for this year? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, well, I'll include a link to that as well in the show notes for this, for this conversation. So on the good news front, though, I, what I noticed was that the time to identify and contain a data breach happens or appears to be significantly reduced. So it's looking like 258 days to identify and contain a breach, which is 26 days less than the year prior. And it's also a seven year low. Why do you think those numbers are going down, Sam? So I, I think uh, there's a couple of points that I've already covered, so I'll do it really quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, this is business is getting better at detecting threats. Security is coming together as a platform approach to consolidate a number of things that were previously point products and solutions that didn't really talk to each other. We also have traditional AI. I'm not talking about generative AI, but machine learning models making a real impact in detecting anomalies in data. So that could be network pattern, that could be network traffic, that could be user behavior that we're looking at through ML models. And that allows us to get earlier warning of attacks without necessarily any rule-based traditional detections being right. triggered. Um, and that's really come into its maturity in the last few years um, and, and started to make a real impact on that ability to detect and respond. I also said that we're outsourcing more to MSSPs who are right. typically much more capable and, and don't have so much of a skills shortage as, as individual organizations do. And I guess the last point that I would make is we've seen an increase in organizations 
um, involving law enforcement uh, when they when they do detect a breach, and yeah. you know, collaborating with their um, with their aligned law enforcement agency in advance is is really the main thing to do here. Um, and you know, that actually made a significant cut to the time it took to uh, detect a breach. I think it was from roughly three hundred days to roughly two hundred eighty, in, in in that order of magnitude. Right. Um, and you know, law enforcement is getting more practice at helping organizations with this. Yeah. They've got access to decryption tools. It's happening much more frequently, right? right? right. They've had to adapt and deal with it like the private sector has. So right. that's been a big impact as well. You know, you touched on this earlier um, and, you know, I am so thrilled to see internal security teams sort of up leveling their game and their capability. They're getting exposed exponentially better in detecting their own breaches, um, which is, and when you think about this, in some instances, when a breach happens, what happens is, you know, a third party discovers the breach and lets you know about it. A hacker sends a ransomware threat, lets you know about it. But when your internal teams become adept at, at discovering breaches, detecting breaches, and and then remediating remediating those breaches, that's, that's a big step forward. I think that, you know, from the report, um, Forty-two percent of organizations detecting a breach themselves were reported detecting a breach themselves this year, which is a twenty-seven percent increase over last year. Like to me, that's a we are going in the right direction, boys and girls. You know. Yeah. Um, what what I also noticed that I thought was interesting is that you know there is a financial benefit to detecting your own breach, and that's sort of like a no uh, brainer, no brainer, right? But the report indicates an average savings of a million dollars in terms of uh, data breach costs, a million dollars on this front. So being good at identifying and and remediating breaches can only help your organization. Um, Sam, you mentioned that having law enforcement involved um, does very much impact, say, you know, the cost of a data breach. And I think this is interesting. I feel like, you know, in, in the early days, um, certainly ransomware situations, um, you know, threat actors really, I mean, just like, you know, when somebody's kidnapped, right, because that's happened to you and me so often, um, Sam, but, um, but, you know, uh, cyber criminals say, you know, do not involve the police. And so you get scared and you don't know what to do sometimes. Or maybe you um, you lead security for a big organization and you don't want to put that information out there. Of course, there's some regulations that have changed that impact that. But um, I thought it was really great to see that involving law enforcement has a huge impact. And, you know, one of the one of the stats from the report was, um, you know, a million dollars in savings on the cost of a data breach, which I, I just touched on a minute ago, but it also impacts whether organizations even choose to pay a ransom. And yeah. your data indicated that 63% of organizations who involve law enforcement opt not to pay ransom once they're involved. So I thought that was a positive thing. Yeah, and I don't think it will come as a surprise to anybody that law enforcement agencies are very much against uh, organizations funding crime and further the crime and making Absolutely. this even more profitable. Um, but, but I think there is a few real impacts that they have adapted to over the last few years that they help organizations with. I, yeah. I mentioned that um, they actually now have access to quite advanced decryption tools. And particularly if you're one of these, um, you know, opportunist uh, criminals that, that goes onto the dark web and and has a, a go at a SaaS application like we just mentioned, they're often very common. We've seen these before and we know how they behave. So there is a chance that, that you know, law enforcement can help you decrypt files without paying a ransom. They can also help you do things like, you know, legal guidance. So help you navigate the obligations you have in that moment in time and provide advice. And they can also, you know, much like for years, you mentioned a hostage scenario, they've been doing hostage negotiation for years. Yeah. They can actually provide, um, you know, negotiation support as well. They can assist in, in negotiations um, invisibly to, to, the, uh, to the threat actor that you might be dealing with. And beyond that, they can do things like threat intelligence sharing. So, right. you know, they may be able to connect you with, with other organizations in your industry or other organizations that have been engaged by the same threat actor um, mm -hmm. to share best practices and, and, you know, stories about, you know, how they came out 
um, of the other side of that as well. So there's a huge amount that law enforcement agencies uh, have adapted to doing over the last few years alone to, to help combat this. I love it. I think it's all uh, moving in the right direction. So one of the parts of the report that I'm always really interested in, although I'm obviously interested in all of it, but I love seeing what organizations are doing from an investment standpoint following a data breach. You, you know, and to me, this identifies, you know, what what cybersecurity um, things organizations are really focusing on. For instance, like incident response planning and testing. 55% of your survey respondents reported they're investing here. Threat detection and response, 51% are investing there. Employee training, yay, 46% investing there. Identity access management, 42%. Offensive security testing, which is actually one of my favorite things, 40%. Data security and protection tools, 34%. Managed security services, 28%. Insurance protection, got to have that, 26%. So um, uh, did any of those responses from your survey respondents about where they were investing post-breach that I just went through, did any of those responses surprise you? Any of those numbers higher or lower or something left off the list or anything like that? I'm always looking for the surprise things that we learn from from these surveys that we do. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'm going to start by directly not answering it, I'm afraid. I think that the <laughs> lack of surprise is really the top one, which is, you know, instant response planning and testing. And, and I think nearly every organization that's been through a data breach understands that the most important thing to do is be prepared, yeah. have plans, test plans. Um, you know, all too often you get into a situation where you thought you were prepared and then actually you start going down a really simplistic checklist for what actually becomes a very complex and interconnected breach recovery and response pr procedure and it's just kind of all falls down and so you know that's why i would say having plans and testing plans and, and instant response planning and testing being the top investment category following a data breach is is no surprise i think the thing that jumps out to me as probably being higher than I would have expected is identity and access management. Um, and one of the things that we observed this year is that uh, often the kind of um, most frequent and most costly uh, attack vectors into organizations dealt with um, illegitimate users presenting themselves as legitimate. Yes. So that could be stolen credentials they could have bought credentials on the dark web that could have been phishing that could have been right. a malicious insider right but any of those attack vectors um you know you can mitigate that risk through the use of sound identity and access management practices right but also through analyzing user behavior like i was talking about earlier right and i think that's the key underlying that identity and access management um investment i think is actually more um kind of monitoring of privileged users and yes. monitoring of user behavior for anomaly yes. rather than kind of a wholesale refresh of the i am stack if you know what i mean yeah absolutely that makes perfect sense you know i was a little bit surprised although as i thought about it employee training is flat the investment in employee training is flat um, post breach from 2023 to 2024 i always you know employees are kind of the first line of defense we know that phishing and smishing and vishing are you know really the most popular tactics used to transmit malware so i think i i personally am always a fan of regular and ongoing training this is not a one and done thing this is a you know creating a culture of security throughout an organization i believe is super important um you know what do you think about that number being so i mean the number's still high it's you know still at 46 percent. so it's not a low number um does, does that that investment seem being the same stand out to you at all or is it just no big deal i mean i guess what we're looking at here we're talking about the top investment categories following a data breach right so this is inherently reactive and that right. implies that there was an underinvestment in employee okay. training prior to the breach right so um you know it, it, it's a good statistic to see that employee training is one of the top three investment areas yes, i agree but it's it's a knee-jerk response and i i totally agree with you by the way in terms of it's always been important, but yes. I think especially over the next couple of years, it's going to be even more important 
when generative AI is creating the most convincing deep fakes, you know, videos, voice, um, yes. you know, emails across all media that we've ever seen. Yes. Um, and actually being able to spot what is AI generated and not AI, AI generated is now going to be a really important skill for employees to learn. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It, it should be top of the list. Yes, I, I agree. I think that, uh, well, and I just think that, you know, in some, as I've been talking about employee training for a long time, and I've had clients who provide, you know, training services and testing, and I'm a super huge fan of not just employee training, but doing regular testing deployment throughout the organization to test, you know, who will click on a link and what that link look like, and just, just looking at employee behavior to see where our risks are and things like that. I think that those kind of exercises, and you can kind of give that too. Um, I think that kind of training creates, um, you know, ongoing awareness about that. So I really like to see where those things are happening. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about managed security services, and I noted there was a small little decrease um, in investment post breach, about 3%, but a decrease nonetheless. What do you think happened there? Anything driving that? And, and could it be um, that we're seeing a little bit of a shift to platform? I think we're still in the early stages of that in terms of platformization being the path that most people take. Um, I think vendors would really like that. I think the security leaders that I talk with are not quite there yet. But do you think that um, that, that shift to platformization is maybe impacting a little bit of you know what we're seeing happening in the managed services space? I think so. Um, I think, you know, those that have, those that have been breached, and again, this is investment following a debt right. brief for an organization. Um, those that have been breached will often either look to outsource or bolster their own internal function. Yeah. And uh, we've seen a slight reduction in post-breach um, investment in managed security service providers, as you correctly say. And I, I actually agree with you. I think it is the rise of very capable security platforms that are often built into the cloud environments that organizations right. are using. And we've seen, you know, there's, I think there's two things we've seen in the industry over the last few years. We've seen consolidation onto hybrid cloud platforms and, and organizations um, being more keen to adopt cloud platforms from fewer vendors. Um, but also, I believe that that's caused us a headache in that data has become even harder to track across these platforms. Yeah. It's proliferating across on-prem cloud and SaaS at such a rate that we often can't keep up and we have to deploy dedicated tools to actually tell us what data is where and how it's protected. Yeah. So um, it's both been productive from a security tooling and platforming approach in driving efficiency, both from a cost and a productivity point of view. Um, but also led to inefficiencies in terms of how we actually go about securing data and finding out what's important. Yeah. Well, you kind of teed me up for my next question. Um, thank you for that, Sam. I know you did that intentionally, um, which actually you did not, but it's me being funny uh, early in the morning. So, so I want to talk for a minute about some key things organizations can and should be doing to keep safe. And, and the report touched on a few of these. Uh, one of them is having a data inventory. One of them <clears throat> is applying data security posture management and other solutions, identity and access management that we've already talked about, tech service management across environments. Um, and, and then there's the situation of hybrid and public clouds, which you just touched on. So I would love for you to kind of walk us through why these things are so important to embrace. Well, the great thing about this report, and one thing I really love about it, is that actually these recommendations we're making are based upon empirical evidence from the last year. You know, yeah. this is not just conjecture. This is, these are the things that have had among the biggest impacts on reducing the average cost um, and time on data breaches. And I, I think some of the ones you mentioned are genuinely really useful to organizations. Yeah. I think that the first thing that you mentioned was, was around that DSPM angle. And for those that aren't aware, that deals with the conversation I was just having, where is your data? Yes. What is that data? How is it protected? And what are the policies around it? Are they up yeah. to scratch? Well, you can't and protect what you don't know you have. Exactly. You can right. only adequately protect that which you're aware of. Um, right. And so it starts with 
with gaining awareness. And, um, and so this is, you know, often uh, firms will do this, um, both from a data point of view, but also an attack surface point of view. So the yeah. rise of kind of attack surface management and those tools to discover what endpoints are out there and what SAP services are operating, what cloud environments you've got, that kind of thing is also an, another really important angle on that as well. Um, and often very revealing that first scan in organizations that have large hybrid cloud environments. Um, and I think the, the other thing that we've seen that we've not talked about so much in this space is just the sheer, um, pace of adoption of AI across organizations today. And AI is going to be a new attack surface with new attack vectors into organizations that we've not had to protect against in the past. Right. And IBM are working really hard. Keep your, keep your eyes peeled over the next couple of months for some announcements in this space. But we're working really hard to help our clients understand how AI is being deployed across their organization and taking that same kind of data security posture management approach and applying it to AI models in terms of what's yeah. proliferating, where is it, how is it protected? Yeah. So that's something we're really excited to, to do uh, towards the end of this year. Um, were there any other kind of recommendations you wanted to dig into, Shelley? No, I think not. I think that, um, again, you have a, a way of getting out in front of me and, and sensing what I'm going to ask you. And I wanted <laughs> to, uh, we're going to now come full circle and talk about AI and automation and how, you know, one of the things I'll step back and say, you know, as uh, you know, certainly generative AI rushed onto the scene over the course of the last year, 18 months, whatever that time frame is, you know, and and if you're somebody who's been experimenting with generative AI and, and seeing sort of all the capabilities, that's wonderful. And then, but, but it's not hard to extrapolate that out and say that all the things that we like using generative AI for cyber criminals like it even more because all of a sudden when you're not an English as a first language speaker and you can use generative AI to help craft perfectly convincing emails or text messages or whatever, you know, it just makes the work that you're doing faster, um, better. And so, you know, you can launch those attacks more quickly. So it is super important to understand that as much as we, um, you know, wearing the, the good, the good people capes <laughs> are excited about AI, cyber criminals are likewise excited about and using it. So, um, so I think understanding that is important, but then AI automation can play such an important role in detection. And, you know, one of the things I know the report showed is that um, organizations that applied AI and automation to their security prevention saw the biggest impact in their security AI investments in this year's study it can, uh, compared to three other security ops areas, which is detection, investigation, and response. So AI investments are, are growing and that's important. There's some benefits to that. Um, you know, what I'd like for you to share, Sam, just if you have some thoughts on what steps an organization can take to embrace a security first approach to Gen AI. Yeah, so let, let me let me first address um, your, your previous point, if you don't mind, just Absolutely. how we're using AI in security use cases, because this was one thing that was brand new this year. And um, it was the first time that we had ever asked um, our, uh, the organizations that had been breached for the extent that they're using AI across the life cycle of security. Previously, it was just like, are you using AI? Yes or no. How much? <laughs> but now we started asking them, where are you using AI? Are you using it in prevention, in detection, in investigation or response? And by far and away, the biggest impact that organizations saw on their average cost of a data breach was uh was in that prevention phase yeah. so investing in ai and automation in the very early stages of preventing attacks is the most effective according to the evidence that we've got this year yeah. but Be before i come on to gen ai and, and detecting those models um you your last episode at the time that we record this was uh, around black hat yeah. and i want to ask you what you think the general mood was at black hat at, in terms of how confident people were about being able to protect generative AI? Because I know that was a key talking point. Not. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, it really... I got the sense that there was a huge amount of pessimism coming out of that conference. Yes. yes. I mean, um... we are, I, 
that we are in the early stages here. It does feel very much like the wild, wild west. There's so much, you know, um, there's so much potential. There's so much to be excited about, but there's also so much to be, oh my goodness, I can't sleep at night thinking about this. You know, I, yeah. I think that's the reality of where we are. And, you know, I made the comment when we were at uh, RSA earlier this year, um, I was getting ready to do an interview with a senior executive of a, of a security vendor. And, you know, I, I made the comment that it's such an exciting time to be in the security space, especially, you know, in, it's not that it's not exciting for everybody, but for those of us who are old enough to have actually lived through, you know, the advent of the internet and and how that really changed everything about our world, our, our personal lives, our business lives, how we conducted business, all of that sort of thing, you know, and, and how transformative the, the internet and, content and social media channels have really changed everything. And so to those of us who, who've walked that path, walking this path as it relates to AI and generative AI in particular, um, it feels like that again. And we can see how transformative this will be. But we also know, I mean, all of us know, regardless of whether you've, you know, you, you've walked that path before, but um, it is exciting and it is transforming, but it's scary as hell too. I mean, it really is. And I'm not sure. Oh, but what I was saying was that the comment that I made was it's an incredibly exciting time to be in cybersecurity. And the, and the guy who was getting ready to interview said, well, I guess you could call it that. I personally find it a little terrifying. So I think that we have, I think we have a lot of CISOs and security leaders might feel a little bit of that terror. Yeah, I 100% agree. But this is just to share a kind of personal anecdote for a minute. This is actually what excites me about being in the cybersecurity field is yeah. you know i was i was always somebody that wanted to fundamentally understand how technology worked and the way that i did that was by trying to break it and by breaking it and understanding how it works and where it falls over you then kind of get a picture of okay you know what is the attacker's point of view how do we go about securing this and i saw a lot of pessimism coming out of black hat but i'm much more of an optimist yeah and i've i i've never i've been working for ibm since 2011 and I've never seen the company so unified in the goal of being able to uh, deploy trustworthy and safe generative AI for enterprise use. Um, yeah. What we did as a, as a team recently was look at all of the best practices that were coming out of the, of the industry bodies that you would know, like uh, the MITRE Atlas framework or the OWASP top 10. And, and a lot of these kind of best practices are really in the weeds of um, the practitioners and, and not really approachable from a C-suite level. So we tried to take all of that accumulation of best practice that the industry and some really intelligent people had put together and condense it into approachable chunks. So um, we, we created the IBM framework for securing generative AI, as many other organizations have done. I like ours, <laughs> but feel free to go and check it out. And it breaks yeah. it down into... Um, securing the underlying data, securing the model in pre-production, and then securing the active usage and deployment of that model when it's an application. And then that's all underpinned by a layer of governance and, and regulatory control. So within each of those sections, we've got what happens if it goes wrong and what are the best practices within each of those areas. So um, yeah, go and check out the IBM framework for securing generative AI. Uh, I'm really proud of, of the work we did on that. Um, but yeah, I think I think I'm much more of an optimist than than uh, the black hat audience uh, implied. Well, I'm an optimist too, and I think it really is an exciting time, and I can deal with being excited and terrified at the same time. Um, and I think that uh, I will I will grab that report and I will include it in the article that I write in the show notes around this show. I want to, um, as we wrap the show, Sam, based on data from this year's cost of a data breach report. I'm going to ask you to leave us with one piece of your best advice to CISOs and security pros and their teams on how to kind of level up their security operations. If you know, if they're if you do only this, what is that advice? This is going to sound really trite, but it but it genuinely is adopt AI. Um, it's it's the biggest hope we have in turning the tides back in the favor of the defenders. Um, the key thing that we saw, one of the key findings we saw this year is that 
the level of skill shortages was increasing, but also more worryingly, have an increasing impact on the on the cost of the data breach year over year. Yeah. So the the only way that we're ever going to be able to turn the tide against defenders is is by increasing productivity and by being able to do things more effectively than we've been able to do before with the same amount of skills, if not less. So um, there are plenty of vendors, regardless of the platform uh, or the vendor that you partner with, they will be doing something to help in this space. Yeah. And we saw that 10% more organizations this year have adopted AI and automation than in the previous year. So not only is it becoming more of a reality, but it's also making a real world impact. And it was the biggest cost saving uh, on the average cost of a data breach that we discovered this year. So that's my parting piece of advice. I, you know what? And I will admit that that would have been my advice. And I kind of guess that's what you would say. I mean, it only makes sense, right? So with that, Sam Hector, Global Strategy Leader for IBM Security, thank you so much for joining me today to unpack the 19th annual IBM Custom Data Breach Report. As I said, this is always one of my favorite reports. I so appreciate you <clears throat> walking alongside and sharing your insights and to our viewing audience and our listening audience. As always, thank you for hanging out with us. I'm Shelly Kramer. You're watching The Cube. Keep it here for all the latest in emerging and enterprise tech news. And Sam, thank you again. We'll see you next time. My pleasure.